Matthew chapter 5 is where we're going to be. Again, looking at the Bible and divorce. So we looked last week at Deuteronomy chapter 24. It's the passage referred to in Matthew chapter 5. And then also in Matthew chapter 19, this is what is being referred to. But at the end of last week, I, I got on something I was talking about. You know, as, as we talk about marriage and divorce, I talked last week about really the, the plan, how, what we should do in looking for a spouse. And, you know, we mentioned if a father doesn't consent to a marriage, is it a marriage at all? And I hope we saw from the Bible that no, it's not. If the father doesn't give his approval, it's, it's not a marriage. But I had someone after that ask me a good question. They said, well, what if, you know, there is no father? So let me just say, as, we're, as we talk about this, and especially last week, we're, we're looking at the ideal. This is like best case scenario, okay? This is what God intends. This is the best thing, if possible, if this works out. But look, we live in a world with uh, sinners, and, and sometimes people don't grow up in a Christian home. They don't grow up with Christian parents, with a saved mom and a saved dad. I mean, there's all sorts of different circumstances. I mean, my father died when I was five. I mean, maybe there was a divorce in the family, and the ch kids are living with the mom or something, or maybe the mom's saved and the dad is lost, or the dad is saved and the mom is lost. I mean, there's all sorts of different circumstances. So last week, what we were talking about mostly was dealing with the ideal. This is like best case scenario. This is what we should strive for. And the reason why I'm mentioning those things is because, look, if, if we want to stop this cycle of divorce that's like rampant in our society, then we need to start learning the principles and the truths that will protect us from that, that will keep that from continuing on in our, our marriages, for one. That's why we looked at what marriage was and, and how we should be as spouses, but also for our children. Let's set them on the right path so that they don't end up in divorce. And again, they're going to have to make their choices and all of that. But look, if we can set them up on the right path, it sure is going to help, isn't it? I mean, that's what we want to do. So we have to, as, as God's people, we have to start going to Him. He's the one that designed marriage. I mean, we believe that, right? Amen. I mean, He's the one that said it in the beginning. You know, I created you male and female. I mean, that's what He, he did it like that. He designed it. So we need to go back to Him, even if what we find in His Word is contrary to what we've been taught all our life. Does that make sense to you? So we have to be willing to change what we believe or what we've followed or maybe what we even got taught in church if it doesn't line up with this. So that was the ideal. Now we're going to continue moving on here. We're in uh, Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to bring up some things. We're going to talk about divorce, a controversial subject. Uh, there's different views on it. I'm going to, you know, I don't know. The, I'm not the be-all, end-all. I don't know everything. I'm going to give you what I think the Bible's teaching, what, what the conclusion I've come to. I'll show you what the Bible says. If you fall somewhere else, that's fine, but this is what I believe it's teaching. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, the Bible says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. He's referencing Deuteronomy 24. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard it that it hath been said by them of old time. No, we can stop right there. I don't know why I put to 35. We'll just stop right there. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we love you. I need you, God. Help me, please. Uh, help me have just clarity of thought, please, Lord. I need that. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. Speak through me, Lord. Be with the people that are here. Fill them with your spirit. Lord, help us to receive this with open hearts, open minds. Teach us, God. Give us discernment and wisdom, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're just look, breaking down these passages real quick so we can know what we're talking about. Then we're going to start to break some things down for, for each of them. But Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaks on divorce. Jesus gives God's legitimate reason for a divorce. He says... But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. So he says, say, except for the cause of fornication. That's the legitimate reason. According to Jesus, fornication is the only legitimate reason 
for divorce. That's what he says right there in verse 32. I believe this truth supersedes all dispensations. It's a timeless truth. It's good in any time. It doesn't matter from the very beginning all the way to the end because God's the one that created it. I mean, he said, look, this is how I created man. And that's even what he, he goes back to. We'll look at that when we get to Matthew chapter 19. But he says, look, in the beginning, this was how I created. This is how I designed it. This is God's ideal. Okay, this is the ideal that God has planned. This is best case scenario. God says one man, one wife for life. That's what he wants. But let me say this. It doesn't mean that God won't recognize divorced people as divorced. It does not mean that. I mean, we've, we've looked at those passages already where he recognizes a divorced person as divorced and not married to that same person. And we'll, we'll, I'll look at, we'll look at another one again tonight, but it does not mean that God won't recognize divorced people as divorced, but it is definitely not his plan, not what he wants. God does not want divorce. I mean, we go back to Malachi. He says, I hate putting away. He hates it. He does not want it. And I think so many people, it's just a cop out now anymore. They just first thing, any sign of problems, they say, well, get a divorce, get a divorce. And again, that whole attitude goes back to dating. Remember what I said dating is? You're just preparing yourself for divorce. You're training yourself and preparing your heart for divorce because you just give away a piece of your heart and then you're heartbroken. And then you give away another piece of your heart and you're heartbroken. You just go to the next partner, give away a piece of your heart and then you're heartbroken. I mean, you are preparing yourself to handle and deal with divorce. That's what that is. That's where it stems from, where now, today, it, just, it doesn't matter. And everybody gets divorced. I mean, uh, divorces are rampant even within Christianity. Where people just changing spouses like, like nothing. It just We have to get back to the sanctity of marriage. See, the sanctity of marriage doesn't just mean that we stand on, you know, it's a one man and one woman and not the sodomites. It doesn't just mean that. It means we actually lift marriage up like it's something holy, like it's something special, like God came down and, and gave it to us. Like God saw a need and he said, here, I'm going to meet this need. We have to see it as something like that. That's what it means to believe in the sanctity of marriage, not just that it's only for one man and one woman. If a person is divorced for any reason other than fornication and they remarry, it's considered adultery. That's what he says in verse 32. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. I mean, that's what Jesus said right there. So we compare this in Matthew 19. There are things that God will permit that he doesn't necessarily agree with. Because in Deuteronomy 24... We looked at that last week. That's scripture, right? All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God breathed that. God said, this is good. So he said then that you can get a divorce. You can give her a writing of divorcement. But he says the, the ideal, the best thing is no divorce, but God will permit some things. God will allow some things. Now, your life after you've been saved, if you've been saved for a month, you know that's true. Because I guarantee you still sin. And God hasn't killed you yet. So he permits some things in our lives that he doesn't necessarily agree with. You see what I'm saying? He might not want it. He might not say this is the best thing. But he's, I'll allow it. I'll allow it because I want to use you. I'm going to help you grow. So just because God doesn't want it doesn't mean he won't permit it. God permits things that he doesn't necessarily agree with, such as polygamy. Poly meaning many, many marriages. I mean, we can think of examples. David, what does it say of David? How's he described? He's a man after what? After God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. How many wives did he have? I don't know, I think four maybe. He might have had more. Probably had more. I can think of at least three. Four, I can think of four. God said he's a man after God's own heart. Does God, is God for polygamy then? What do we, what would we, why, why would we say he's not for polygamy? Because in the beginning... I created them male and female, created one help me for one man. 
See, that's the ideal. We go back to God's original intention. He's right there in the beginning. So we know he's not for polygamy, but did he allow it and did he still use these people? Yes. He permits some things that he's not for. You understand what I'm saying? How about the worship in groves? Some of you are like, what are the groves? Uh, groves were a thing associated with idolatry. But God even allowed his people to worship in groves. In the groves. Worship him in the groves. And it ended up turning into idolatry, but he allowed them to do it. I mean, there's instances where they're worshiping him in groves. And he allowed it. Leaving the Canaanites in the land as they go take the promised land. He said, kill them all. Get rid of all of them. I don't want any, none of them left. But you read in Judges, and they left them. God permits some things that he doesn't necessarily want that isn't the best thing. That's my point. If the ex-spouse remarries, as it says right there, back to uh, verse 32, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Okay, so if you put away your wife, other than, a re than fornication, you cause her to commit adultery. And if you marry her that's divorced, you commit adultery. Okay, so if, say, that divorce happens and then the ex-spouse remarries, we well, just think about this. I just want you to think about this. You don't even have to answer it now. Just think about it. But if that ex-spouse remarries, that would be considered adultery, right? Okay, so if that took place, is that now grounds for the divorce from your now remarried but fornicating ex-spouse? Because they're now technically fornicating. And it said that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery. So if you put your wife away, you get a divorce, and then you're not remarrying, you're not doing anything, and then she goes and, and gets remarried, or she starts sleeping with somebody and fornicating, is that now grounds for your divorce? Is that legitimate grounds for your divorce? I'm just telling you, think about this. What do you think? I mean, to me, well, now fornication has taken place, so is the, the divorce legitimate now? Something to think about. Does this adultery or fornication now legitimize the second marriage that took place because their fornication took place? Just, these are just things to think about. Because it said, save for the cause of fornication, you cause her to commit adultery. So if you hadn't done anything but she committed adultery, now are you free to go remarry? You see what I'm saying? Do you, are you following me with what I'm saying? You following what I'm saying? Just, I just want you to think about it. All right, the next instance we see the Pharisees approach Jesus and ask him about divorce. Go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 is where we're going to pick up. All right, Matthew 19, 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So they come to him, they're tempting him, they're trying to trick him, trip him up, trip, trick him in his words. And they ask him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So can a man divorce his wife for just any reason? That's what they're asking, for every cause. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? What does he do? He takes them right back to the word of God. That he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. So what does he go back and do? He takes them back to God's original intent. This is how God planned it. Again, the ideal. This is what God intended marriage to be. He takes them back to the very beginning. Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So he says, hey, in the beginning God designed it like this. They're, the man's going to leave his wife. They're going to cleave to each other. They're going to be one flesh now. The two have become one. Verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. And he makes this statement right here. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So what God has put together in that marriage, that's what marriage is. It's God joining this man and this woman together. The Bible says, Jesus said, don't let man tear it apart. That's outside of man's authority is what God's saying. We don't have the authority to do that. 
Don't tear it apart. Don't take it apart. That's what it says. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God joined it. They say, okay. Verse 7, they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? Again, that's, he's referencing Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4. We looked at that last week. But he asked, they asked the question, well, okay then. Fine, because you're bringing up, have you not read? Well, how about this? Why did Moses... Moses wrote Genesis, right? So why did Moses, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, then write Deuteronomy chapter 24 is what they're telling him. Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? I mean, that's a logical question to me. Like, well, the Bible says that you could, have a, you could divorce. So what, what gives? Verse 8, he saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you or allowed you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. That's again, it's going back to that. God's going to permit some things He doesn't necessarily want. It's not the best, but He will permit it. He'll allow it. What do you think is going to happen anyway? I mean, God can forbid some things, but what are people going to do anyway? Because of the hardness of their heart, they're going to do it anyway. They're going to get that divorce. Or some people, even still to this day, will murder a spouse. That still happens till death do us part, right? So, all right, we'll take care of this. It, it still happens today. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He says, that's not God's ideal. That's not what God wants. Verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. All right. Let me say this. God deals differently in different dispensations, and Jesus is clearly dealing with the dispensation of the law as he's addressing the Pharisees' question regarding Deuteronomy 24. He deals differently in different dispensations. I'm going to read you a, a quote here by Bruce Lackey. It says this regarding this topic here. God made changes in the various dispensations. He changed what He required man to do from one age to another. He also gave permissions in one age that He did not give to others. Until He gave the law through Moses, man could offer sacrifices to God anywhere. Isn't that right? I mean, they just, who was the priest? the father. That's where that blessing came in. It would go to that, that, that son would now be the priest of that family before the law came down. That's what they did. And they'd offer sacrifices wherever they wanted to because the father of the home was the priest of that family. He went before God. So until he gave the law through Moses, man could offer sacrifices to God anywhere. But in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 to 14, he required them to come to a particular place and to that place only. Now in our age, we do not even offer such sacrifices. So you see what I'm saying? God deals differently and has different requirements and he'll even change them at times. We don't offer sacrifices anymore. Why? Because he's things changed. Amen. Christ paid that. There's no, need, no longer any need to, to picture those sacrifices, what Jesus was going to do. Why? Because He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Those sacrifices and all those offerings in the Old Testament were all shadows of the real thing that was to come, which was Jesus Christ. So we don't have to do that anymore. It's been done away. God's working different now. Clearly then, God has changed His requirements and permissions for mankind from age to age. Christ's plan for the church age is not found in Matthew 19, but in 1 Corinthians 7. How can we be sure of that? By remembering that Christ lived under the dispensation of the law. Obviously, though, this is me here interjecting here. Obviously, there was a major transition going on in the gospel and Acts, though. I mean, things are definitely changing right there when Jesus Christ shows up. There's a transitional period in the gospels and Acts. We need to understand that things are changing. Okay, the quote goes on. Thus he observed the Passover, one of the regulations of the law of Moses. So Christ observed the Passover. He kept the law perfectly. Um, that's how he could pay for our sins. But we are certainly not commanded to do so today. We don't have to keep the Passover today. Christ is our Passover. Christ explained Deuteronomy 24.1 to the Pharisees because they were still under the law. We are obligated to do as Christ did with the Pharisees. 
distinguished between what God gave through Moses for Israel during that time and what God's original plan was. In other words, we must rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So look, let's go back to God's original plan. That was the ideal. That's the best thing right there. Uh, Matthew 19, Matthew 5 is God's ideal as God lays down his original intent for marriage. He says, this is the best thing. This is what I want. Look, even if fornication takes place within a marriage, even if there's adultery, do you think God wants a divorce? No. He still, even in that, doesn't. You say, how do you know that? Because look at how his description, just start looking up, you know, all the... Uh, so many times God says that the children of Israel played the whore. They played the harlot. They commit adultery on him. And yet he kept them. 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 And then finally he did something about it. We'll get to that. I don't know if we'll do it tonight. But he finally did something about it. The Pharisees, though, they ask if it's lawful to divorce for every cause or for any reason. And Jesus, again, first takes them back to God's original intent. And his answer is that man has no authority to split apart what God has made one. Look, man cannot take upon himself authority that God has not given. And I don't care who that is or what entity it is. It can be a government or anything. They don't have the authority to do that. God created marriage. And we don't have, we will stand there and say, well, hey, government has no authority and no right to say that a man and a man is a marriage. And we'd be right to say that. Why? Because God said he made a male and female. God told us what it was. But we'll stand hard on that. But then on divorce, we're like, oh, well, that's okay. Well, we don't have any authority in that either. See, we need to follow after God's ideal. But because of the hardness of our hearts, God allows some things. But it doesn't mean we should condone it or help it or encourage it along. Just because there's instances where it does happen and it's going to happen in this sin sick world that we live in. I'm just telling you. But we can't take things for us that don't belong to us. And God says we don't have authority in that. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They follow up with, well, why did God command Moses to give a divorce then? Jesus' answer is, not, is basically that it's not what God wants. He wants union for life, but he's going to allow it. Verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And we know Moses isn't just saying what he wants to, it's the Lord. He's under inspiration of God. So God's saying, well, because of the hardness of your hearts, I'm going to let you do this. God will allow it. Because man has a heart problem, God allowed and even recognized divorce. He did go back to Deuteronomy 24.1. We're not going to do that tonight. We were there last week, but go back to it. He recognized it. Again, we see the only acceptable reason for divorce in God's eyes is fornication. Look at verse 9. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. A man may put away his wife and not marry another, and there's no adultery on his part. Do you know that he could get a divorce or the woman? You know, I'm just going based off how it's worded right here. So somebody could get a divorce and not remarry, and there's no adultery. Look what it says right there. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. But if they get divorced and never remarry, there's no adultery. So let's say again, I'm just, I won't think through this. Say that's the circumstance. Say a man and a woman divorce. Okay. And you've got the man, he's just living over here, nice and single, okay? Here he is, lonely, single, he's divorced. He hasn't remarried, and the wife's over here, and she meets, you know, this good-looking guy over here, okay? And then now they get married. Is that adultery, according to what we're reading right here? Yes, so is that fornication? So think about this. Is he now allowed to remarry? Right? Save for the cause of fornication. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Which is some things to think through. So what do we do then? In regards to this, it says... 
saved for the cause of fornication or accepted be for fornication. So what do we do with Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 and 28? Let's look at them. Again, Matthew 5, 31 and 32, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. So if fornication's involved, it's okay. Not okay, it's not that God wants it, but you understand what I'm saying. God says, go, go ahead, you're permitted. Okay, now, Matthew 5, 27 and 28, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So what do we do with that? Is this grounds for a divorce? It says adultery is taking place. If you look with lust, is that grounds for a divorce? I would say so. What? Then like any of us could get divorced? I, I mean, I don't recommend it. I'm not saying that. I don't think any of us should. But I didn't say that if you look with lust, it's adultery. Jesus said that. And we're going to look at where the Bible equates adultery and fornication is the same thing. Because some people argue, oh, well, fornication is different. Because there are places where you're going to see fornication listed and adultery. But I'll show you where the Bible says they're the same thing. Let's look at some of those right now. Matthew 19, 9, we were just there. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for, what? Fornication. Fornication. Well, what is that speaking of in a marriage? I mean, even there in Matthew 5, 32, but... Matthew 19, 9, what's that speaking of? Whosoever shall put away his wife, so obviously this man and woman are married, except it be for fornication. Well, what, what would that be? What would we be talking about in a marriage, speaking in regards to this? What would we say? Well, most of us would say, well, the reason they could get divorced then was because what, what happened? Someone commit what? Adultery. You see fornication and adultery are equated right there. 1 Corinthians 5.1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. See, now most of us have heard, probably most of our Christian life, that God never permits divorce. God never allows it, and that's just not true. Think so what, Pastor, what are you like promoting divorce or something? You for divorce? Of course not. That should never happen. I would never counsel anybody to get divorced. Really, I never would. I just, no, you separate, if anything. But I understand there's circumstances where it may need to happen. I don't think it's best. I work through it. People get divorces, they don't ever work on it. I mean, I've talked with people. They're ready to get a divorce or they're th going through the process and they are not working on their marriage. They're not trying anything. They're not actually seeking God. Both partners aren't seeking God. They're going after their selfish wills and what they want rather than what God wants. And that's usually what it boils down to. So I'm not for divorce, but I'm, I am showing us what the Bible says about it and that God recognizes it and it's permitted. So here again, we see Fornication and adultery equated, 1 Corinthians 5.1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. All right, church in Corinth, some wicked things are going on. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. He said, this thing's so bad, the Gentiles don't even act like this. Or what's he saying? That lost people don't even do this. What's going on? That one should have his father's wife. What do we call that? What do we call that? If you take someone's wife, what's it called? Adultery. Adultery. But 
the Bible said there's fornication among you. You see how the Bible's saying fornication and adultery are the same thing? See, fornication can be likened to this, sex outside of marriage. Whether it's before you're married with somebody, that's fornication. Whether it's you're married and it's not with your spouse, that's fornication. But that specifically we'd call it adultery. Yes, that's the specific type of fornication that it is. It's adultery. But even, I mean, what sodomites do, that's fornication. So fornication is like a more all-encompassing word versus just, you know, um, like uh, adultery within a marriage. But what 1 Corinthians 5.1 is talking about, it, it calls this adultery that's taking place, it calls it fornication. And that's my point, is that fornication and adultery are equated with one another. Let's look at another spot. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2.21. Letters to the seven churches, the church in Thyatira. We're going to pick up probably verse 20. Revelation 2.20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Here, this is just a little parenthesis here. You ladies that are pregnant, don't name your daughter Jezebel, okay? All right, that's a freebie. Okay, all right. So it says, you suffer that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Verse 21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit, what? Adultery with her. Now this is speaking spiritually, but you still see the language being used. It calls fornication and adultery, it equates them as one and the same. One and the same. So now, let's go back to Matthew 5, 27. The Lord Jesus said, I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. That's fornication. The Bible said it. Adultery and fornication are the same thing. So if you look with lust, you're a fornicator. Verse 32, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, save for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. So, is that grounds for a divorce? I would say yes, according to the Bible. I showed you, that's what the Bible said. Am I for a divorce? Nope. Should you get a divorce? Nope. Is it grounds for a divorce? The Bible said. What if a man's addicted to pornography? Is that grounds for a divorce? What's the Bible say? But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. That'll destroy a marriage. That'll ruin a marriage. And some would say, he hasn't committed the, the physical act of adultery. God said he did. He did it in his heart. It's fornication. It's fornication. Matthew 5.32 and 19.9 both use the Greek word porneia. It's where we get our word pornography from. This Greek word is used 25 times in Scripture, and every time it's translated fornication. Every single time. I can give you the references if you want. Here's a few of them. I won't give them all to you. Maybe I will. Matthew 5, 32, 15, 19, 19, 9, Mark 7, 21, John 8, 41, Acts 15, 20, and 29, Acts 21, 25, Romans 1, 29, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 13, and 18, 1 Corinthians 7, 2, 2 Corinthians 12, 21, Galatians 5, 19, Ephesians 5, 3, Colossians 3, 5, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, Revelation 2, 21, 9, 21, 14, 8, 17, 2, and 4, 18, 3, and 19, 2. Those are all the references for it. 
I probably was going too fast for you to write it down. Maybe you got some of them though, but we record it so you can go back and listen or I can give them to you if you want. My, the point is that each time that that word is used, it's speaking of fornication and that's exactly where we get the word pornography from. These are legitimate questions that I'm bringing up that we have to ask ourselves. So is there a legitimate grounds for divorce? Does God recognize divorce? Yes. Yes. Is he for divorce? No. No. He says, I hate putting away. I hate it. Don't do it. Go back to his original intent. One man, one wife for life. That's what God wants. That's the plan. That's the attitude we need going into marriage. That's the attitude we need in the middle of marriage. All the way to the end of marriage is that this is till death do us part. We're going to fight for our marriage. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We have to equip people stepping into marriage to, to have this mindset, to lose the world's mindset that if it doesn't work out, we'll just call it quits. Forget that. Get rid of that. We can't think like that. We can't think like the world. Or we'll continue doing the things the world does. We need to understand that God does recognize divorced and remarried people as married and only married to one spouse. Let's go to John chapter 4, please. We've looked at this. I want us to see it again because God does recognize divorced people. And He recognizes them as divorced. Furthermore, He recognizes them if they're remarried as only being married to one person. John chapter 4, verse 17. He's speaking to the woman at the well. Verse 16, actually. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. Look, she says, Hey, I want this water that, that springs up into everlasting life. Give me that water. I want to drink it. He says, Okay, great. This is good right here. Hey, it's kind of like we ask the question, you know, Hey, if you died today, you sure you'd go to heaven? You sure your sins are forgiven? You know, what are we doing? We're saying, Here, here's, you can know this. John, 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. God uses that for us. Amen? I'm telling you, look, there's different reasons people get saved. I got saved because I was scared out of hell. And Jude talks about that. And so, uh, now, some have compassion, others saved from the fire uh, of fear. Let's just turn to it because I'm butchering that verse right there. Save your spot right here. But there's different reasons that God reaches people. Um, and, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Others save with fear. Amen. That's why I got saved. I was afraid of going to hell. I realized I was going to hell. And I I don't want that, Lord. What do I do? And I turned to the Lord and received Him as my Savior. I didn't want to go to hell. But others, it is that offer of eternal life. I want heaven. I don't know a person that doesn't want heaven. And Jesus used that. He said, I'll give you water that will spring into everlasting life. You'll never thirst again. Jesus used that. He said, I want that. And then what did he do? He said, okay. He switched it up on her. Very smoothly. But he switched it up on her. He said, okay, go call thy husband. What was he doing? Now he's God. He knows things we don't know. But he went to the law of the Lord. He used the law. Because he knew she was committing adultery. He knew she was fornicating. See? He used the law on her. But look what he says, though. It's important to re recognize what, what he says. Um, so uh, go call thy husband and come hither. Bring your husband here. Verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said I have no husband. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Because people argue that, hey, if you're divorced, you're still really married. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus said. He told her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Verse, verse 18, For thou hast had five husbands. What? This woman hasn't been doing things right. He's using the law, but he says, Look, thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. So again, that proves that just the, the, the actual coming together, the, the consummation 
or consummating doesn't make a marriage a marriage. We talked about that because people use that argument, but it also proves that, you know, that, that man that she was with now was not her husband. She was probably living with him is what the implication is given here. But before that, she had five husbands. And none of them are still her husband. God doesn't say you have five husbands, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. Someone could argue and say, well, you know, maybe they all died. That's definitely not the implication given right here. You're, you're stretching some things if you're going to try and say that, because that is not the implication that God is giving right here. He's using this to point out her sin to her. So God does recognize divorced and remarried people as married and only married to one spouse. And now we're going to look at next week. I'm not going to get into it today because it'll probably I'll probably spend 20 minutes on this here trying to, to take us around. We uh, dealt at length with this last night in the Bible Institute, but we're going to hit it again. I'm not going to get to it tonight because we'll be here till it's already 910. I'm just kidding. I haven't set that clock back. Uh, it's 810 right now, um, but we'll probably be here for another 30 or 40 minutes if I continue in on this. You guys look, yeah, go for it. No, I'm just kidding. We won't do that. All right. I don't mind doing it, but I'm sure people want to get home. So we're going to look at this thing here, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So I encourage you, go read that. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to focus on verses 8 to 15. But you could read the whole chapter, it's even chapter 6. We're going to focus on verses 8 to 15 in regards to God's final word on marriage and remarriage. And we need to pay attention to the words that are used. And again, this is why it's important we have an every word Bible. Because the words are important. They're very important how things are worded. 